This episode, I'm joined once again by Earl Biao. We discuss his latest book, The Meaning of Being a Man, alongside discussions on Heidegger, masculinity, and gender politics. If you'd like to purchase Earl's book, please find links in the description below. I'd like to thank all my paid subscribers and patrons for making all of this work possible, and if you'd like to support Emetics or become part of the community, there's also links in the description below. Enjoy. So, Old Biao, thanks for coming back onto Hermetics podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, to discuss um, what will probably be a controversial work in of contemporary philosophy, uh, your latest book, The Meaning of Being a Man, which I th- think, you know, from the, uh, from the title, um, listeners will be able to garner what it's about, but the brief overview would be that it is a... Heideggerian analysis of what it is to be a man, specifically a man, in contemporary society. And I think there's a couple of sort of things to add on that, which is you outline right at the start of the book, you have these rules. So one I think that is really sort of prescient and in a way poignant and quite sad is you state that you are viewing what it is to be a man without comparisons to what it is to be a woman which is basically what you say and somewhat i would i would agree that contemporary gender theory is a constant back and forth like oh you want to know what it is to be a man well first we need to address what it is to be a woman um and there's a few other rules you follow so you know you're talking about it from a male perspective um and you're sort of taking the heideggerian route stepping back and assessing what it is to be a man without going through like the preconditions of contemporary gender theory. So you're saying like, you know what? Most of what you've been doing is wrong. I'm going right back and we're going to start again afresh, which is basically what Heidegger did with being. So I think it's a, it's a, wow. It's a good, (laughs) put me up there. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) what an introduction. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So not only are you controversial in the fact that you're one of the few, I think, you know, sort of working academics who's taking on gender, theory you know like a what do you call it an agent on the inside but also using heidegger so he's yeah. also fairly controversial in terms of what people will probably think oh this is a right wing book whatever we'll get into that so um yeah thanks for coming on so why did you write this oh <laughs> it's something this book has been brewing inside of me for 20 years I think so um, I've always I've always been interested in this I like I like being a man I like women I think they're great I think they're fantastic but I also think men are fantastic uh, and um, so I've always been interested in this but when I when I was uh, I, I studied sociology in the 90s and very soon I found out that the theory is and the forums where you could discuss this within the university made no sense to me. They didn't give me anything. So I just said, okay, fine. Away, if I, yeah, I'll just leave that and then go do other things. But it's kind of just, it's been sitting in me for a while, uh, for a long time. And, um, and then uh, a few, uh, a couple of years ago, this was when, yeah, so a couple of years ago, I had this sense that there was that something happened. And for me, the publication, Jordan Peterson publication of 12 Rules for Life kind of stands as a uh, as, as, as quite an important event. Um, not necessarily so much in terms of the c- content of the book, but the mere fact that he wrote it and he said some of these things. And what I felt was that a field was opened here. And, 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 and something that also happened is that he became so popular to the extent that there was almost like a quantitative, a quantitative confirmation that there's a huge interest here. There's a huge audience that has not been addressed. Um, so I think that kind of opened the space and I thought, okay, that's my opportunity. And then after that, a lot of others have followed. So, um, so I could kind of finally I could uh, sort of start thinking and writing about these questions that I that had some sort of been murking inside of me for for several years, um, and and 
also, you see, so that was like part of sort of my personal. But also another thing that also meant something to me was that I've, I have a lot of, I have a lot of fr- friends. I have a lot of male friends and I have a lot of male friends with, and also colleagues with whom I talk about these issues. And I just had this felt feeling that more and more men were getting interested in this but they didn't know how to talk about it. They didn't know where to talk about it. And um, and that also inspired me to say, okay, I will write the book that I would like to read, but also the book that c- can kind of help or facilitate that type of uh, conversation. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting in the book, what do you say about Peterson? And you, meant, you do mention this in the book that one of the big criticisms of 12 Rules for Life was like people were saying, well, these are really basic ideas, but we haven't had basic ideas and basic like masculine or, you know, yeah. should we say um, hierarchical or just like clear rules for a long, long mm-hmm. time because they get, you know, we've had uh, eras of post-structuralism and deconstruction. And of yeah. course, oh, should we be doing these ideas? Should we be questioning the authority? But, you know, he, he, as you say, sort of took this stance and said, well, how about we just go back to basics and see what's been missing? And as you said, what was revealed was generations upon generations of men who basically hadn't had this. Because I think it had been assumed as part of the curriculum for general life, but hadn't actually been taught for a long, long time, not since sort of like maybe the 60s or 70s. And since then, it's just been assumed. And there was, you know, I think people who sort of criticize him for how basic it is, it's like what I always thought was outstanding, like, astounding was that how prophetic and like awe inspired people were by like stand up straight with your shoulders back the fact yeah. that you know millions of young men and i imagine some women as well weren't taught those kind of things is like wow you know we've yeah. leapt too far we we we've, we've missed something yeah. um so and that does sort of lead me to like one of the things that made me laugh and I suddenly made me suddenly realize it as well at the start of your book is you sort of say, you know, in the academy, it's like we ha- we, we ask, what, what is it to be gay? What is it to be lesbian? What is it to be trans? What is it to be black? What is it to be Asian? And you, you, there, is, there is studies on every single one of these. But the one question, and of course, what is it to be a woman? And then every, you know, a lesbian woman or a trans woman, blah, 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 yeah. et cetera, et cetera. You know, these, these are fine. Go study them. But at the same time, what has never been asked and never been answered is, what is it to be a man? Why do you think? Why do you think this has been left to the side? I think, I, um, it's a good, it's a really good question, and I, you, you, you gave it to me already yesterday, and I've been thinking about it ever since, and I haven't really. It's not something I, I don't think the book actually provides an answer to that really brilliant question. I think. Well, let's start with. Let's try this one. Let's let's. Let's say that the feminists, they're halfway right. I think it is true that when you look at the history of philosophy, when you look at Kant's concept of the subject or Descartes' ego or, uh, or even Dasein, uh, those are, on the one hand, on the surface, they are non-gendered concepts, right? So they should apply to men and women equally. Mm-hmm. Maybe... Maybe the feminists are right. Maybe they are right to that. Well, maybe they are modeled on like a male, uh, uh, like a man. Maybe that, maybe. Um, so in that sense, it, it's been there in a sense, but, but not explicitly addressed, but just something assumed. I think it's very, when you read the Greeks, when you read Aristotle or when you read Plato, I mean, they, they, they talk specifically about men, right? So it's kind of assumed there. Um, so I think in that, I can, I can kind of follow some of that critique. However, I, I don't think what, 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 what some critics, feminist critics then do is that they say, so therefore we should discard all of the history of philosophy. I don't think, I, th- I think what you should do then is to say, well, okay, we don't, it, Descartes doesn't work for me. A woman could say, and if she said that, totally fine with me. And then she would say, and therefore I will now write a philosophy of what it means to be a woman. Totally fine. Go ahead and do that. 
But then in that movement, I think this, there should also have been opened a place for someone to say then, okay, that, but then let's explicitly, let's test this. Let's, let's test Descartes or let's, let's, as I do, let's test Heidegger and say, okay, so it's a non-gendered concept, Dasein, it could be that there's a bias towards the masculine, maybe, maybe, uh, but let's, if we want to then just say, okay, okay, let's see how it applies to being man and see how far we can go and what we need to, need to, um, but, but, but I think what has happened is that either you, it's been presumed that either you were talking about this sort of a non-gendered subject or you were talking about women. So um, I'm not answering your question. I'm not answering why, so why has this been neglected? I, but maybe to sum up, it, I think for a long time it's been taken for granted. And then in the second wave, it's been like delegitimized. Mm -hmm. mm, so, and I don't think any of those two are necessarily. Um, and then I think it's also, I think other disciplines have kind of taken over that. I think biology to some extent have taken over some of that. But I, that's also what I say in the book. I think biology, they, it, 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 it also comes up very quickly, comes up against the boundary in terms of this question. So uh, I think your question, now that your question is a lot better than my answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's something I will definitely, it's going to think, think more about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think that um, if you sort of, you know, when that second wave came in, as you said, do you think if, if the academy sort of took the conclusions of, Feminism. Admit, I'm just going to put it out that I am. I do not know feminism well. Like I know the sort of standard definition of yeah. it, but I think that's fairly useless thing to say now because, as far as I can see, it's going off in so many directions. I can't really keep up, and it's not yeah. a personal interest. But when that second wave came in, if the academy took the conclusions that you know there is this uh, underlying oppressive patriarchal society that we're living in, that men yeah. are, you know, that it is a patriarchy. If you took that as true, then I think you would then question, well, why are we, you know, why are we um, spending time assessing the masters, right? So you might say that if you were coming at it from a left wing point of view, you'd say, why are we bothering, you know, uh, analyzing men? They've got it all. They're, they're the winners in this situation. So yeah. why do we care? Right. Yeah. We, need to, we need to like address the, yeah. the, the underdog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I, if I understand you correctly, that that could also be a, an explanation that we've been there's a certain we've been problem or, oriented that in in academia there's also always a, there, there has been not not but but maybe for the last 40 50 years there's been a bias towards problems we're looking for things that don't work um and then there's been this idea that oh there's no reason to look at men because it seems to be working for them. That that would be your. Yeah. That could be another. That could be another. Uh, yeah. As much as I like your question, I can also feel now that what we're doing, we, we're getting, we, we're we're talking about feminism. <laughs> so we're, we're doing, violating the yeah, rule. Yeah, yeah, we're we, we should be doing rule. that. And I actually, I'll say, I I think I mentioned. Um, I'll go out on a limb. Maybe it's not correct, but I think I mentioned feminism exactly zero times in the book. Someone could test that. Did if, you sort of? Did you did you have to sort of keep an eye on that as you were no, writing it? No, not really. But it was it was it was because I felt that as soon as you as soon as you go into this, it's also it's so so before I I wrote this book, it, the book book actually started. I started writing a book about Jordan Peterson, or at least a text about Jordan Peterson, and then after working on that for five months, I kind of felt I got stuck. First of all, I didn't know what really to add. And then at the second time, I also felt that I would go into these long critiques of feminism, like, oh, feminism, this, feminism. And I was just like, I, why am I doing this? Why? I don't even, I don't even care. I mean, <laughs> I don't even care really if feminism makes, I, and I think it does, and that's perfectly fine. If it makes sense to someone, oh yeah, I identify as this and that makes, and I feel oppressed or whatever it is, Fine, go ahead with that. So I also felt, why am I? Why should I spend so much energy, kind of trying to put that down or anything? So, so the, the the what the the energy of the book is that I wanted to 
make something which could stand on its own, like if you want to, yeah, okay. yeah. So the, import, yes. the 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 importance of say of um, you know removing this question of what it is to be a man from the framework of contemporary gender theory yeah. or comparisons is that as soon as you do that it becomes completely not the thing that you were talking about it becomes yeah. it's a difference between a question of what it is to be a man and what it is a, to be a man in relation to feminism which are actually extremely different questions yeah. and also you're sort of playing their game so you're saying yeah. like we're not even we're not even doing this whole contemporary gender theory side of things we're just yeah. we're not doing that which i think yeah. you know it's a brave move <laughs> um so maybe- it's, it's the same as if you're in a relationship, mm-hmm. you can spend, some people do that, they can spend 50 years complaining about the other person, mm-hmm. thinking, oh, if only the other person was like this or that or that or didn't do this or didn't do that, then I would flourish and come into my full being. Mm-hmm. However, as long as he or she is not doing that, I'm just going to stand here and not. That's one approach. Yeah. Or you can say, well, the other person may have his or her flaws and they have their own thing to deal with. I'm in a relationship with the person. I love the person. However, now I'm going to just step back and say, what can I do? What can I, not being dependent on the other, but just here, what can I change? What can I do in my life? That's, uh... what can, how can I understand myself? So that's also, that's kind of the approach that. Um, that I'm taking here. Um, you, you bring in a fairly, you know, with that metaphor though, you bring in a fairly sort of sad point though, which is that, you know, in the, the first scenario you give there of uh, the couple where the man's constantly worried about what the other person's like, he becomes entirely not himself and he doesn't focus on himself. Yeah. He doesn't improve himself yeah. because he's constantly focusing on trying to improve the other person or trying to uh, putting the other person on a pedestal or trying to like win them over right yeah. and trying to prove like oh i am a good guy like we'll work this out and then the second scenario you know you have the guy who's like i'm gonna work on myself you do you but we're yeah. still our own we're still our own uh people yeah. so it's like you have a man you have a woman and then you have the relationship so it's like three yeah. separate things yeah. so you know you bring that into the the thing that we're talking about is what's happening is uh you know men are losing what it is to be a man in this conversation. So I think maybe we should just draw a line, do the masculine thing and draw a border, put down <laughs> or put up a wall, um, and begin with like your 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 theory, your sort yeah. of how you use Heidegger. Um, because otherwise, you know, I think we would end up in loops because you can't really you can't win. To be you? honest, to, to be honest, I could just as we're having this I, I much enjoy the conversation, that's not it. But I could <laughs> sense it as we were talking, I could sense I was starting to get a little bit tired. Or I could hear my voice going up and I could kind of feel, oh, now I'm up here. And it's, I just, ah, uh, I get some, I don't want to be there. No. Uh, no. So now we, uh, we don't start all over, but uh, yeah. No, no. But Let's I think, no, to... we needed to, we needed to lay that out though. I think it's yeah. important. Um, so your, your um, sort of theorizations here begin with sort of um, basic Heideggerian theory. Um, you have Dasein and I think, for anyone who doesn't really know Dasein, uh, it's being there, being there, yeah, yeah. yeah and the one. sort of the primary unique factor for what a Dasein is is that they are a being who is self-analytical. They are uh, like aware of their self and they are investigating their self, sort of at all times. Yes, that is true. However, this self-analysis is not a. It's not first and foremost an a cognitive thing. Mm-hmm. It's first and foremost something that plays out in my immediate interaction with the world. Mm-hmm. So as I'm doing whatever I am doing, like the classic Heideggerian example would be chopping woods or something like that, I would be in that chopping wood, I would be in a relationship to my own being. So I am realizing my own being, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we can also move into a more sort of contemplative or think about what this means and reflect on it more. But I think it's it's important to stress that that's, that that's not where Heidegger starts. He kind of starts with this immediate thing. And that's also why in the, so you said in the introduction that I take a, you, I take a male perspective mm-hmm. in the book, which is, it's true. However, I don't use those words. 
I, what I say is that I write as a man mm -hmm. and I write to men. And what that means, it doesn't mean that, that I talking about something that only men can see or understand. That's not the point. But the point is I, I talk from a point where I am always already existentially invested in the question. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking to other beings, other men who are also always already existentially invested in this. And then when we are, so that's a, and then after that, we may be intellectually invested in it. But even if we're not intellectually invested in it, we are still existentially invested in the question of what does it mean to be a man? And for Heidegger, it, it, was, it would only be, it would be something along the lines of what, what, is, what does it mean to be? What is the meaning of being? Kind of was his f phrase, right? So I hope I didn't sidetrack your... No, no, not at all. And yeah. I mean, what's, what's interesting there that, I mean, I'm not sure what Heidegger would sort of make of this. And I don't know Heidegger well enough to, you know, he, he, I, when you said at the start that like, um, there's these critiques, oh no, I'm struggling really hard not to go back. No, 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 it won't be, we won't go back. You say there's these critiques where they say that Descartes can't, Heidegger, their notion of the subject can be said like, oh, it's yeah. already masculine. I can't see that maybe with Descartes. I can't see that with Kant. Heidegger, yeah. absolutely not. The whole point of Dasein is it's yeah. just being. Yeah. Um, no, that, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Capital yeah. B, being. Um, and oh, Although I do have, but finish the thought, and then I do have an, a remark on that. Oh, no, no, just say the remark, because I'm going to go into a question. So, because I, I don't know if we... Yeah, this is a podcast, so we can kind of move around. Uh, but I would actually say that one place where I think that there's a man or masculine, I, I don't know, I also make the distinction between man and masculine, but where, where there's, if, if there's a man bias in Heidegger, I think it is on his focus on mortality. Mm -hmm. Whereas what I do in the book is I bring in an aunt, Hannah Arndt, and for her, her key like thing is natality. So Heidegger, focus, he says, well, the thing, the, the, the thing that kind of characterizes all of us is that we, we will die eventually. And of course, I mean, that goes for men and women equally. But there's another point which is equally important and maybe even more important is, first of all, that we have been born. He would also go with that, I think. But also that we... It's part of our being that we can uh, give birth to new life. And I think that's something that is under theorized in Heidegger. And that's a place where you could say, even though I think that also that goes for men and women as well. But I think it's a I, I don't think it's a coincidence in that sense that it's actually art who points this out, uh, that we should think that, that natality is equally, if not even more important than mortality. So you're saying that the question of natality would be more of a, a primary focus for a woman? Well, again, now we're, I didn't, I specifically, that's, and that's also something I struggle with in the book because I don't want to make these I, claims or, and I actually do, I do say that even or also for being man is natality is extremely important, but but um, maybe we could, that's a further research is needed. So, um, yeah. Yeah, but going back to, so you have Heidegger's conception of being, this is what he, you know, this is his whole thing is uh, yeah. going way back to the pre-Socratics and saying, we took a wrong turn. We need to go back and address being because of course, yeah. you know, one example would be Descartes saying, cogito ergo sum. Uh, I think therefore I am. Were you going, well, okay, that's fine. But what is am? What is it to, you know, to be? Yeah. And this is the, yeah. the problem for Descartes, uh, for Heidegger. Oh, Heidegger. So he goes all the way back. And so we have being. Now, one of the arguments you then begin to make is that straight after being in a certain sense, I mean, almost like a priori, I think a question would come in there that when is it you realize you're a man, which we could probably touch on. Um, but a priori is straight after that is being for you, being dash man. So being man. Yeah. In that. You can't just be a being. You can't just be this sort of amorphous like blob who's no. agendered. You address the world as being man or being woman. Yeah. Um, and you're saying that, well, let's, you know, this instantly 
gives you different understandings of the way in which you immediately interpret the world. The, even yeah. I, you know, I would I would argue as I imagine you would that the, the the example you gave earlier of chopping wood that is going to be an entirely different act when interacted with uh, as being man or as being woman. So what for you is is does being man come straight after being? Is that an immediate thing for for men? It's um, it's uh, gleichzeitig is the German word uh, at the same time. It's at the same time. So the whole. Um, let me give you another example. Let's take a lion. What does it mean to be a lion? So a lion is a lion. Is it first an animal, and then a lion? No doesn't make sense it's a lion from the get-go and 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 actually so if you want to know what it means to be a lion we would ask a lion we can't do that but kind of and then and for the lion and the concept of animal is a completely abstract concept how I, let me ask you this question how many legs does an animal have <laughs> You don't know because you've never seen an animal. No one has ever seen an animal. Mm -hmm. They've seen lion, they've seen tigers, zebras, elephants, ants, what have you. And then we lump them together in an abstract category and call them animals. But it's an abstract concept. And I make the same arguments in terms of human beings. We have this tendency of thinking, first we're human beings and then on top of that, or an add-on, or whatever, then we become either men or women, or whatever, right? Where I say, no, I think it's the other way around. I think you are born into the world, you come into the world as being man, or as being woman, being boy, or being girl, um, and then being being a human being is not it's it's that's an that's an abstract concept that we can then invent in the same way as that's why I also I I I avoid the concept of gender completely mm -hmm. throughout the book because it's it leads us into science vergessenheit it leads us into a place where we can't think about this question of what it means to be a man because again gender is have you ever seen a gender mm -hmm. no we do you, do you think do you think the difference between being man and yeah. gender is actually ontological and ontic in that gender is like this, you know, this socially ontic, culturally yeah. uh, I, so invented thing. Whereas being man, being woman is an ontological uh, truth. I, I'm, I don't know if I would go that way. I think there's several ways of going with this one. If we stay with Heidegger, we, we could say, so Heidegger would say, let's take this pen. So he would say, what is, what, what, what is the being of this pen? How, how, do, how do we know the truth of this pen? And, and Heidegger would say, well, the way, the, the way we know it is when we start writing. So I start right here and I can write, and I don't think about it, right? But I'm kind of disclosing the truth of the pen. Mm -hmm. That's one way. The other one is I could measure it. I could weigh it. I could take it apart and see what's inside and what is the material. Um, and that would be, so Heidegger makes this distinction between uh, present at hand and ready at hand. So when we write, it's ready at hand, and when we measure it and objective I say we it's uh, present at hand. Mm -hmm. I sometimes get them confused, but I think that's right, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, and I think we could say the same thing about gender and being man. Mm -hmm. Being man is ready at hand. It's like what I just do or what I what I am when I'm just right. Whereas gender is, so, it's like, oh yeah, let's reflect on this and let's measure this and let's think, make all this abstract thing. And then we're in this, um, th then we're in this present at hand mode, which is a more abstract. That would be one way of going with it. Then I also make another analysis where I, <clears throat> I take Heidegger's concept of das Mann in German. So the they. Mm -hmm. So he has this critique. He also talks about um, uh, uneigentlichkeit and eigentlichkeit. So 
which in in English is translated into authenticity and inauthenticity. It's, it's not a really good translation because eigen, Eigenlichkeit has something of taking what is your own, taking responsibility, taking complete responsibility of what is your own uh, and what is you. Uh, and whereas Uneigenlichkeit is not taking this full. And I, I think this concept of agenda is, it can sometimes have this tendency that it's something we use to escape part of what we are. It can be a way of escaping being man. Mm -hmm. um, so, 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 so that's that would be like sort of more the ethical or, yeah, the ethical analysis of the distinction between the two. But the main point, is, which is a key key point in the book, so I'll just summarize that, is that I reverse this idea that first we're human beings and then we become either men or women or whatever. I reverse that and say, no, 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 first we are, I'm a man. And then we can have this abstract idea of a human being. Um, so. So what's, what's masculinity? Um, so I, so what I find is that oftentimes when you talk with people about these issues, men and women, or even if you just listen to people talking about it in public debates, it, these conversations, they very often they go like, they, they are extremely messy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they often end up places where they don't really make much sense. I think there's multiple reasons for this, but one of the reasons is conceptual confusion. Because we use words, sometimes we say male, sometimes we say man, sometimes we say masculinity, but we're not really clear what we mean when we say these things. Things. So one of the, another key uh, contribution of the book is that I make a distinction between, I say that in the constitution of being man, there's three dimensions, three existentials to talk with Heidegger. And the first, or not the first in sort of any order, but just one is male. Mm -hmm. And that's biology. That's kind of my body is a male body. I have these chromosomes, I have a penis, I grow a beard and stuff like that. So, and male is either or, either you're male or you're female. That's it, right? That has to do with your chromosomes or your reproductive organs. Um, so, and then there's another one called, which is masculine and feminine. And masculine and feminine, it's not the same. Masculine, masculinity and femininity is something Everyone, even men, we also have femininity, mm -hmm. right? So, so femininity and masculinity is a both and. We can have both things in us. And then finally, there's, there's the ethical dimension, which is this being man, we will, or man, which we will probably maybe come back to. But anyway, the second dimension, masculinity. So I, what I say, masculinity is, is kind of, um, it's the answer to the question of, I have this uh, table that I'm quite proud of. So male is the answer to what I am. What are you? I am male. Man is the answer to who are you? What kind of a man are you? Who are you? And masculine is the answer to how are you? How, how do you like it? How, what do I like? So, so when I interact with the world, I find myself drawn to different things. I, I, I kind of li like some things. I don't like some things. I'm attracted to some things, not attracted to other things. And also, other people react to me with like the desires and so forth. And that order is, in that order we find a polarity or a balance or an interaction between the masculine and the feminine. And those are kind of forces that work inside each of us, but also between us. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. I don't know if you're looking for a particular, there's more answers to that, that question, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you, you don't think masculine and feminine are? Do you, do you think they're socially um, developed or created or change over That's, time, or do you think they are sort of um, almost like you yeah, know uh, it's a, really a priori and like intuitive? Yeah. Because I think they're intuitive. I think when people say you know there's a yeah. debate when I was younger about blue and pink, and I think well, what is it that draws men to blue and women to pink? Mm. you know was it sort of chicken and the egg yeah did they create a load of pink 
toys yeah. first or I yeah I it's it's actually it's something I after I finished the book this is a question I've been thinking about because I'm actually quite I don't say very much sort of substantially about so what is what is it to be masculine what is it to be feminine I don't like say yeah blue is this or uh, so I think on the one hand I think the mere fact that we are even the mere fact that we are the thing that 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 things around us kind of affects us like affects our desires and our, our interests and so forth i think um that has to do with the mere fact that there are these two energies masculinity and femininity so in that sense it's ontological the fact that there are these two life forces um however uh what what i do say is that the just like biology if we want or if we want to know something about the body if you want to know about my, the male we can study that through science if we want to know what something about masculinity and femininity the place where we should go to or we we go to is the arts or culture in general that's 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 kind of a lot of what what that is is about if you look at movies if you look at paintings if you look at novels films whatever it's a lot about this interplay between the masculine and the feminine and through that we kind of learn what is the masculine what is the feminine um at the same time i don't think it's a um so your question is whether it's cultural or 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 fixed in a sense Transcendental, yeah. I guess you could say. Yeah, I kind of. I mean, that's why I. Um, it's maybe it's because I use Heidegger. It's it. It didn't really come up like mm-hmm. this question. I kind of avoided it, or it. It just didn't. Well, one one of one of the things I think I could throw in here, which I I think is probably my favorite, like quotable part of the book, was that mm-hmm. just a paraphrase. You state that gender theory study. Con- well, I guess yeah, gender theory studies humans. As if we're not animals, yeah. um, and I think that's one of the best sort of encapsulations of starting from the wrong foundation, and then from yeah. then on, you have to, you know, your your logic has to be so skewed, and you have to go through so many loops and hoops yeah. to make anything make sense. Um, and if we are to go back to this point where you come from, and saying no, 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 we are animals, we have these, you know, we have the chromosomes, we have the genitalia, we have this firm animalistic basis to begin this invest yeah. ontological investigation from then i think we could we could argue in terms of masculinity and femininity there are natural things that differ between men and women men are like men are more destructive women are more nurturing and these are natural inclinations in their in their being mm-hmm. i would argue i yeah i don't actually so what you said about what i said about uh, gender theory there i say that gender theory they kind of I say gender theory studies people as if we are not animals and also as if we are works of art. Mm-hmm. So, and a work of art is something you can, you start with a blank page and you can draw whatever you like, or you can write a s- novel, you can write whatever you like. There's no limitations. And that's kind of how they treat the a person is you can be whatever you like, right? There's no na- natural boundaries or anything. So, but I also say that evolutionary psychology or evolutionary biology mm-hmm. they study humans as if we were only animals so i think i think also biology doesn't can't explain enough but then what i do rather than then stay in this oh is it all culture or is it all biology then i say no it's ontology mm-hmm. and of course we know ontology is something it's it's like one of these rabbits that philosophers can kind of throw up. And you don't know what else to say, which is, it's ontology. And then everyone's like, they don't really know what it means, but they, yeah. So it's also, but, but, but I do think there's, there's something in it. Um, I don't, I, um, I think, I think it's true. I think we have an intuitive, I think I also do write that in the book. I think we do have an intuitive sense of what is masculine and what is feminine. And I think we have an intuitive sense that the things that are masculine are, are things that we somehow need in order to become men. So I have an analysis of, or I write about 
how when I was a child, I, I saw uh, Rambo, First Blood. And in that movie, Rambo, he has this knife, he has this jungle knife. We'd never seen a, a knife like that before. Like, and there was like uh, these, uh, he could also use it as a saw and he used it for all kinds of stuff. And as soon as we'd seen the movie, we were like, we got to have one of those knives. <laughs> so uh, I couldn't have one. Uh, my parents thought it was too uh, dangerous. But my friend, he got one from the local toy store. And this sense, we knew that's a masculine thing. We need one of those, right? So we have that intuitive sense. Uh, but it's also something, it's also very difficult to kind of pin it down. And I'm also not sure we, uh, would we want that? Would we like, why would we like to have a map of what is masculine, what is feminine? As long as we just say, well, mm, uh, as long as we, we we don't go the way of just deconstructing and say, oh, it doesn't matter or anything. No, it does matter. It, it, it matters a lot. But um, I don't know. I think it's one of life's mysteries. It's on the one hand, it, we know it. I mean, even children know it. They have this sense like they knew blue or... Uh, or but but it's the, the, the problem. I, that's also the problem that... that um, evolutionary biology something comes up against is that well but well there are men who like purple or, or pink right so what to do about them how how then we can even it out to statistics or what but it's um, uh, it's a little bit like okay so so for instance take something like love i also write about love in the book but do you know what love is no, no. Do, do you need to know? Or, or, yeah, but on the one hand, you don't know it. But on the other hand, of course, you know it. If you love someone, if you love your mother or something, you know that you just know it. Right. And I think it's the same with masculinity and femininity. On the one hand, we just know it instantly. And but when we're asked to define it, then maybe we get into trouble. Maybe I can quote the. Um, we need to move on. It's interesting, but yeah. So I'll just uh, quote uh, my favorite quote from Wittgenstein is the following. So he says, I'll say it in German and then I'll translate it. So he says, Es gibt allerdings Unaussprechliches. Dies zeigt sich, es ist das Mystische. So it means there's things that we can't say in words. They show themselves. It is the mystical. So I think in a sense... Masculinity and femininity is it's mystical, and that's a good thing. It just gives it more. Do you, you know two or two other I think Heideggerian terms that would probably be interesting to bring in? Um, falling and idle talk. Um, yeah. Now, hopefully, you can sort of give an overview of what these are. But do you think these two terms are actually some of the reason why being man in society is just is, is, has has disappeared from a perspective of being man? Men aren't ever really given the position to say, how about you, do you, you mm -hmm. know, do, do you as a man want to actually think about what it is to be a man? That's yeah. not an opportunity men are given. And I think we're led into what we were, what would, we could probably define the first 10 minutes of our conversation as yeah. an idle talk, right? Getting drawn yeah. into something which yeah. isn't to do with the ontological question we're actually wanting to answer. So I actually, so I, I don't answer that question in the way that you pose it there. So I don't have a critique of, oh, so modern society is doing this and that, so we can't talk about what it means. There's not a lot of that. But what I do instead is to say, well, it seems it is true that a lot of this, um, that, that we've, we are to some extent failing or we're not sufficiently engaged in this question of what does it mean to be a man? But rather than saying, okay, let's find the external causes for this, I go the other way and say, well, let's understand from the perspective of uh, the individual man, why would it make sense to pull back from that question? So I'm not asking, I'm not question saying, why does society prevent us from this? But I'm asking, why do we go along with it? Mm -hmm. So, so why do we go along with it? 
And the reason we go along with it, with idle talk and gender and all this, oh, it's all a construction and blah, blah, all this. Why do we go along with this? And the reason it comes back to this distinction between being a human being or just being a person and being man. So being a person, a per, being a person is something you are just by definition, just by being born right away, you're a person. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything. You, you stay a person all your life, regardless of what you do. So it's being a person is it's easy to be a person because there's no demands or it's or however, of course, it's exaggeration, but but still it's it's quite easy. Whereas being a man, very difficult, very, not only very difficult, impossible. It's an impo it's a, it's a constant demand. And so, so being a man, on the one hand, yes, it is something. So you're born into the world as a boy, you have a penis, and then you kind of know, yeah, if I just not die before I'm 20, I will become a man, sort of. At the same time, we all know, or at least men, I think women also know this, they know it also. We all know. That's not all there is to it. Being a man is also something you have to earn. It's something you have to live up to. It's something you have to strive towards. And and you never finish. You, I mean, even when you're 60 or 70, you're still struggling to be a man. So there's an ethical dimension to this. It's something we aspire to. It's a, I also talk about as a calling. We're called to be a man. Like a, we have this task, holy shit. So, and, and that comes with the risk of, there's a lot of benefits in it. There's a lot of meaning in it, but there's also the risk of failure. You can fail to be a man. And that's like, holy shit, that's really, that's not nice. So I think part of the reason why we, why we will accept this more sort of gender neutral identifications and stuff is because then we then we can pull back then we but then we don't need to risk we it's 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 we, we we're not uh we're not sort of we, we we try to escape from from these fundamental challenges so to speak i also use um kierkegaard so his concept of the ethic the ethic is something, someone who, who accepts uh, the decision or takes the decision upon himself. Um, how does that fit? So, yeah, maybe I, I no, that, that this is not the right place to, to bring that in. So anyway, so my point here is that just like in Heidegger, there's this, if Dasein just lets himself or lets itself sort of float into the day, then it can blame, it can sort of, put responsibility for its own life into the they. Mm -hmm. They say you should do this. They are to blame that this and this happened. They are not doing enough this and this and this. They, 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 they. And then you can kind of just sit back and, yeah, it's all, I, uh, I can't do anything or, and, and, and avoid responsibility. So once, but once you kind of say, no, I'm a man, therefore I have an obligation to become a man. Then you take responsibility for your successes, of course, but also for your possible failures or not even for possible. It's you're guaranteed to, as a man, you're guaranteed to fail, not completely, but you will fail like from time to time, of course. So you think, um, we're as men, we're avoiding this, this responsibility. We're just getting, we're just getting pulled into the day. We're not, I don't, we're no. not, making, we're not, or do you, or do you think it is that on a general level, we're not actually, made aware of that decision that decision slowly being removed from something we might even see well again i don't know the, so the we that you're talking about now hmm. is i don't I, I i i i i'm not sure that we i see a lot of um, i see some men doing this i see other men doing the other thing i see a lot of <laughs> Good men, and and then I also see men doing both. Sometimes they do one, sometimes they do the other. So I also don't think that sometimes there's this. We hear this. Oh, there's a crisis of masculinity and a crisis of men and stuff. Mm, I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, 
yeah, I think men are doing really great. I, I see men doing brilliant stuff all the time. So, uh, but it is, I mean, it is true that there is this trend in some areas of society where we're kind of being not just provided with this opportunity of letting ourselves slide into this they, this genderless they, this kind of thing, slide into that. Uh, we're even being told that it's a virtue. Ooh, you're even, if you slide into that, you're even better than the other one. So there's all, oh, we're kind of being seduced or whatever. It's, it's, it's very, very easy, very, very comfortable to go that route. But I also see many, many men uh, and also young men like uh, choosing a different path or a different direction. Uh, do, do you think that's sort of, um, not to sound too controversial, but unhealthy to sort of push against what seems to be a, um, an ontological reality? If you push against that, then you're not going to end up anywhere nice. Which one of them two do you mean? Like the going into the day, if that's a... Uh... Well, make, making the decision to do something else which isn't being man. Ah uh, no 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 that's not no I mean I mean oh. either some of, I see some sliding into this they think and then others going into not going into that but insisting no I want to be a man mm -hmm. I want to take that up upon myself I want to take that responsibility I want to take I want to act in the world and but stuff. There, the, what I'm saying is there is a lot of men who are actively actually going in the opposite direction and being critical of being a man. Yeah, that is also true. Um. Um, and the question is whether there's a good, a good or a bad thing, or um, what do you think? Um, <laughs> it's my point is not so much to I, that's that's another thing I'm, I'm skeptical. So in 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 this most a lot of gender theory, there's a lot of judging. It's a very normative. Actually, the analytical and the normative oftentimes get completely mixed up, right? And um, and I'm not into, that's not to say that I also, I mean, there's probably also some judging in my book, but it's not, my point, my main point is not to judge this. Uh, first and foremost, because I think there's part of us, it's not like we can say, oh, there's these men, they go this way, and then there's these men who go that way. It's also something that we, Sometimes I go this way and sometimes I go that way. So it's also something that's kind of struggling inside of us, right? Um, but I do, I do think we are, as a society, we are, and also people as individuals, they're losing out on a great potential. I think, I think we should rather than, I think there's a tendency sometimes or in some to see being man or masculinity to view that as a liability. Mm -hmm. And I argue that it's an asset. Mm -hmm. It's an asset. It's, it's a potential. It's like, uh, I don't know what I would like having a car in your garage that you never use, or I don't know, that's not a good image, but anyway, it's like having a potential that you're not utilizing. Mm -hmm. uh, we should think of we should think of being a man as a gift. Oh, I've been given this gift. Wow, I I have to do something with it. Just like if you've if you've been gifted as a, being a really good football player, it's also something you should do something about, right? And I've, I mean, and I don't mean that again. Just to stress that I mean I don't mean that in opposition to being a woman. That's also a gift. So we should treat both as a gift. But I think what, what, what's happening instead is that we are kind of, oh, I've been given this uh, piece of shit. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to push that away and then elevate myself into something higher. That's an, it's an interesting sort of – the footballer metaphor is actually an interesting one to, to think about though in that you have this, um, let's say, an innate um, – being which has with it certain character characteristics and traits in certain ways that you may or may not view the world you know you might take charge of things you might you know put down borders put your foot down take you know mm -hmm. um, be more ordered all these masculine traits etc um, what's interesting there in the idea of you know if you take that footballer metaphor of someone who knows they're naturally gifted at football but does nothing with it what would be interesting to me is what happens to generations of men who are like that who just 
understand they have these, let's say, like abilities, assets within them, but feel as if they shouldn't use them. What is that being then? You know, that's like an altered being man, right? And you, it's yeah. almost like a, a, you know, like a, a sleeper agent who's just a bit dead and yeah. depressed. And yeah. So the question is, what about them? Yeah. What, is, what, 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 what do they become? I guess. What are they? Well, um, I want to. I think I want to. That's up to them. That's undecided. Some of them. Some of them, at some point, they're going to blow up. Mm -hmm. They're going to blow up and they will blow up someone else or blow up themselves or like destroy themselves or whatever. That's kind of one route. Mm, Some of them is just going to live a complete full life. Uh, realizing uh, 45% of their pot- potential mm. and they will die and, and, and they will say oh, they, he was a nice guy he had a nice life fine uh, and then some of them will turn around and say no now uh, I'll do something else and you can do that I, and, I, and I think that's that's um, Mm, that's I, I mean we hear these stories about people but I've, I, I know several or not but I, I know more than one person more than one man who's had his life changed by Jordan Peterson mm-hmm. so it, it that says something it doesn't take very much to spark that no, that, no. oh what I can change my life I can and it's good that I'm a, uh, so um I will give a little life hack to uh, if there's any if there's a men out there who are thinking, oh, that sounds cool. I want to do that. Where should I start? Um, so another concept that I avoid to try to avoid in the book is the concept of identity, huh. and that's because identity is something which is seems to be in front of me. So it's a little bit like so. Here's I don't know if the camera can show this. Here in front of me, I have the mouse. I have these two options. I have my identity. I can be this or I can be this. It's in front of me and I can choose. Do I want to be this? Do I want to be that? Do I identify with this? Do I identify with that? Blah, blah, blah. It's in front of me. We can get caught up in that. It's, yeah. So what I like to do is, and also, so the whole being man, it's not an identity. It's not something that's in front of us. It's something that's coming from behind or we are sort of thrown into the world with this. So, um, and another thing we are thrown into the world, so we're thrown into the world with our being man. So the first thing you need to do is just come to terms with it and accept that as not something you have to choose, but something that has chosen you. Something has chosen you to become a man. Wow, chosen me. I wonder what they want with me. I wonder what they want me to do. I, I better figure that out, right? So, and another thing, is um, I don't write so much about, but it's, it's, this is a bonus material. The biggest resource in a man's life, do you know what that is? What do you think it is? Let me think. Let me think. Authority. Being able to take charge. I don't know how you measure that as a resource. No. Time? It's, it's, it's something you get for free. Time? Nope. Go ahead. Tell me. Your father. Okay. Yeah. So, and again, there's one we can do our father. We can place our fathers. uh, We can place him in front of us like this. Oh, here's my father. Yeah. I will judge him. This is good. This is bad. This I don't like. I would have liked more than this. He was not there. He was doing this. Judge, 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 judge. Like, so I take responsibility for, yeah, who I would want my father. You can do that. Sucks energy out of you. Mm-hmm. You can also put your father behind you and say, okay, I have a father. I also have a mother. They've brought me to this world. They bought, they, 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 yeah, they, they, they throw, they throw me into this world. My father is part of who I am. Just like my leg or my head or, mm, so I, rather than kind of spend a lot of time judging it or distancing myself from it or I should just, yeah, 
this is what it is. This is how it is. This is how, what he is. This is what I am. He's part of me. Blah, blah, blah. There's, um, and if you do that in the right way, you can, you get so much energy. I will, uh, so you can do this little test. And I've, I've, I've noticed this also because I work with it. When I listen to men talk about their father, I, I listen carefully. When they start criticizing their father, or even when they start talking about forgiving, oh, I forgive my father, something like that. I can sense energy, strength goes down. But when men talk about their fathers like uh, in good terms, like so, so he brought me into the world, or I'm a man just like my father, or my father taught me this, or something like that. Energy, strength goes up. And then someone will say, yeah, yeah, that's very nice for the standard reaction for some is like, yeah, that's very nice for people who had a nice father, but I didn't. He was a bad blah. And then they go into it. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. What matters is that he's your father. What matters, you owe your, or you don't owe anything, but you're kind of, you've been given your existence by your father. That's a huge thing. Huge. Also your mother, of course, right? We should learn to, yeah. Um, take that there's just so much energy in that so um, that's a good place to start uh, and it's also I mean with Heidegger it's also part of his eigenlichkeit is kind of taking respons- full responsibility for even for the fact even for the things you have not created yourself so the fact that you're thrown into the world at a particular time place in time and so you kind of take responsibility for that even though you didn't necessarily create it so I didn't I didn't choose my father nobody did and yet I um, we find that very when we have children we find that quite easy to do people are much less they don't criticize their children in the same way they don't like oh I had I had the wrong child or you, you, we don't do that we're like wow I have a child that's a gift we should kind of think the same way uh, with the things that's coming from behind. So. Okay. Okay. Is there anything you would um, like to add about the book? That would, you know, the content that we might have missed. This aunt. But I don't. Yeah, I just want to say, like, she was. Um, she kind of came into the book. Sort of, I don't know, not by coincidence, but I just thought, oh, okay, I can use a little bit of art here, and then it just grew on me, and I found that it was very so. So the first half of the book, or the first section, or the first chapters, they talk about being a man, what that means, but then I start talking about being with, being with other people, and also being with women. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? So that's part of being a man is that you are in a world where there are others who are not women, who are not men, they are women. So, and so I use her to think about what the things that we can do with women. So just like we had this male, masculine and man, I, I take aunt, she has this question of doing, what do we do? Yeah, uh, different modes of doing. And I, t- so I talk about procreation in relation to male, that's kind of what we do with our biology. And then there's sex, which is related to masculinity and femininity. And then there's love, which is related to being man. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a whole, that's, that's a big part of the book is also talking about these things, love and and sex and and, um, and male. And one of the things that, occur, that occurred to me is also how at least at least, and, and, and that's it with the thing that I haven't read, so I haven't read that much gender theory then, but I, I just hear about it. But it, it strikes me that like someone like Foucault, he's written several books about sexuality. I don't recall having read very much by him where he talks about love and, and nothing where he talks about having children. I could be wrong. I, maybe it's in there and maybe he's... But, it's, it just strikes me why, how, because for me, I mean, love is at least as important as sex and having children is even more important, but it, it just keeps, like kind of falls out of these uh, discourses. That would be, I think we'd be end up uh, getting, getting taken back into their, yeah. their language again. 
So, whereabouts can we find this? I know we can find it on Amazon, uh, The yeah. Meaning of Being a Man by Oral yeah. Biao. So, that's O L E B J E R G. Yeah. Um, but also, you have a website where. Um, I, I, Ol- I just... Ola isn't paying me for this, by the way. I'm just. Uh, I guess we should probably say, like, I was the. I sort of said to you about self publishing. Yeah. So I'm sort of really happy to see this come to fruition after sort of uh, quite a while. Um, so I think if anyone's listening to this and they they do want to purchase Old's book, I'm not. This isn't. I'm. This isn't a plug. He's not paying me anything. Um, <laughs> so, I can't afford to pay you. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, but there's a. Is it the meaning of being a man dot com? Yeah, the meaning of being a man dot com, and in, there you can also buy. You can buy the ebook directly there. Mm-hmm. I've also put up a link to where you can buy the hardback. However, I'm not sure. It's, it takes a little while for the hardback to get out there. So maybe the link doesn't work yet. Um, but it will also come out in other, other outlets mm-hmm. uh, in hardback format or, and also in ebooks. So I'm, I'm sort of, but I'm doing all this uh, thanks to you, mm-hmm. James. You, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It, and it's a big part of my sort of, also sort of a, gaining my own sovereignty is also taking responsibility for my own text. So I was really inspired last time when you uh, yeah, encouraged me to publish myself. That's been quite an adventure for me. Yeah. So but go to my website uh, and um, yeah, there you can buy it. Okay. All also. the, all these links will be uh, in the, in the description. So go there if you, if you've liked the conversation. So yeah, old Bia, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.